Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the podcast, The Joyful Frugalista, and now here's your host, Serena Bird. Wanting to bring more abundance into your life in 2023? I'm super excited to be hosting another one of my signature six-week courses, Six Weeks to Abundance with The Joyful Frugalista. The next course starts on Tuesday the 24th of January and runs for six weeks from 7 o'clock every Tuesday night. Now as a special for all of those people listening to my podcast, I have $50 off each of the courses. Normally they're $250, but for you dear listeners, it's only $200. Please use the code PODCAST. You my frugalisters and welcome. Today I have a special guest and of course all of my guests are special. This guest is someone who has a really interesting story with some non-conventional advice about trading. And if you've ever thought about getting into trading, make sure to check out his book. But first, I have a favor to ask of you. If you enjoy this podcast and find it useful for you, then please pay it forward by sharing with a friend. And even better, please follow the Joyful Frugalista podcast on your listening platform of choice and also join the Joyful Frugalista Facebook group. Simon Ree is the author of the number one best-selling book, The Dow of Trading, and he's the founder of DowTrading.com. He has three decades of experience in the financial markets, having previously held senior positions at Goldman Sachs and Citi. His vision is to help people live more creative, joyful, and inspired lives by alleviating the burden of financial stress that weighs so many people down. And that is really a very important vision and one I share, although my method is perhaps slightly different. So a disclaimer, first and foremost, this is not financial advice. We are talking here about Simon's book and about his views. Your financial strategy is something you need to get your own advice on and make your own decisions. So welcome, Simon, and congratulations on your book. My pleasure, Serena. Thanks for having me. So as as we were saying, I really, really love your title, especially the reference to Taoism, which some people classify as a philosophy and others as a religion, but it's certainly one of the three main thoughts or religions within China. So why did you choose to include this in your title? So just a little bit about my background. In, in addition to being a trader, I'm also a martial arts teacher and I, I'm, a, I'm a certified instructor in Jeet Kune Do. And Jeet Kune Do, if you haven't heard of it, is the martial art that Bruce Lee developed. And Bruce Lee wrote a wonderful book called The Tao of Jeet Kune Do. And so really my book is a, it's a tribute to, to Bruce Lee and, and his wonderful book. As you're probably aware, the Tao simply means the way. And what I wanted to do with my book was write a book on trading that instead of just giving people a bunch of setup, really goes from start to finish in terms of the, the, the way of becoming a successful trader, incorporating things like psychology, mindset, emotional control, how to be a, a happier person in your trading and you know, how that can manifest in, in, in better trading results, risk management, re- really looking at I guess, a, a more holistic way of, uh, of approaching the subject. So Taoism is often all about flow. I do Tai Chi, which is also a Taoist art form. Awesome. Well, really, it's, it's one of the martial arts forms, but as you know, it's all about flow. And Lao Tzu and his disciple Chuang Tzu and others, as you know, they talk about that the object is to make things look really easy and flowy, but that doesn't mean that it happens overnight. There's a lot of practice that goes into that. But the aim is to get to things that look like they're effortless. Yeah, it's a it's a good analogy. Trading is trading is simple, but it isn't easy, and it, it takes it does take practice. It takes lots and lots of reps, but it's the sort of thing that when you when you first start out, it it, it might seem almost impossible, but with with practice, it, it becomes almost second nature, if that makes sense. Well, I guess if you're doing it all the time, but yeah, yeah. I guess a fairly sim- simple question is to start with was. Well, what is trading? So trading is, well, let's talk about what a trader is. So a trader is somebody who buys a financial asset with a view of selling that asset at a higher price sometime in the future. It's as simple as that. You're trying to buy something low and sell it high. Uh, And that's it in a nutshell. 
Now, a lot of people will think, oh, hang on a minute. You know, that's what I do with my investing. And, and I would agree. I, I think most people in my experience who think of themselves as investors really and truly are traders. A, a trader is anybody who's looking, like I say, to buy an asset lower than where they sell it, buy low, sell high. To me, an investor is somebody who really deeply understands a business and, and they want to be a part of that business because they believe and they understand the growth drivers and they, they want to partake in the increasing cash flow and revenue streams and, and dividends that will flow from that over the very long time. Uh, and, and they may never may never end up selling it. But if you're if you're invested and you care about quarterly earnings reports or you care about what the Federal Reserve has to say or you care about the CPI report, really and truly I, I think you're a trader. You, you just may not realize it yet. I think you make that good point in your book that so many of us are traders. We just don't realize we are. Or we don't admit it to ourselves. Mm. And then the, the, the problem is if, if you're taking that approach of you, you are watching price and you are looking to buy low and sell high and you are sensitive to things that move stock prices around in the short to medium term, you can fail because you don't have a robust risk management plan. Like you, you, don't know, you don't have a plan for what you're going to do if things happen that are unexpected or unwanted. You talk in your book too about how a lot of people don't have really good stop loss kind of strategies that you give the analogy of if it falls a certain amount, what will you do? And then people say, oh, hold. And then it, what, if, what if it falls a bit more? And what if it falls a bit more and it gets to about 40%? Well, what will you do then? So what do you advise people to do in terms of should they just be buying and holding? Should they be buying and selling? What's the ideal kind of approach for a successful trader? It depends on really your financial objectives okay and obviously this as you said at the top this isn't financial advice but generally if, if you want to if you're happy earning over a market cycle 10 percent per annum buy and hold can work really well and it's it's simple and it's fairly low stress and you know yeah you kind of buy a reasonably diversified portfolio and and you can be fairly passive with it now it really depends on your financial situation if, if you've got a million dollars saved up 10% per annum is a meaningful return. So it's $100,000 a year. If you've got $10,000 saved up, 10% per annum, it's $1,000 a year. I mean, it, it's not bad, but it's, it's probably not going to really move the needle in your life that much. Now, that can still work if you're, if you're young and you've a long runway ahead of you. you know, if, if you keep doing that for the next 30 years, that compounding effect can can really grow your wealth over the very long term. But if you're if you're starting with a small amount of capital and, and maybe you don't have that 30, 40 year runway, that this 10% per annum, it's it's probably not going to deliver the sorts of results that are really going to be meaningfully impact your life. So the traditional kind of doctrine, I guess, around risk is that the higher the likely return, the higher the risk. What's your views on that? I think this is one of the greatest misconceptions in finance. And to understand why, we, we need to talk about what risk really is. And risk is the possibility of loss. Okay? Risk is the possibility of a permanent loss in your money. All right, so what the traditional finance industry wants us all to believe is that to increase our chances of winning, we have to increase our probability of losing. All right, And, and we've been buying this nonsense hook, line and sinker for decades. That's because it just gets parroted and repeated over and over and over again. I've got a much better hypothesis, alternative hypothesis, and that is to increase our chances of winning, we've got to be very vigilant and responsible for minimizing our chances of losing, not increasing them. Mm. All right. So I call this the, you know, the, the low risk, high return strategy. And, and it even bears out empirically. If, if you look at uh, quantitative surveys that have been done, Low volatility funds over the long term tend to outperform high, high volatility funds. That is interesting because we've even seen here in Australia, I guess in the last 12 months or so, just with looking at, say, Vanguard, usually a lot of people go for the VD high G, the, the high growth. And this is talking about ETS, which isn't necessarily your view of trading, by the way. It's more of a set and forget, usually buy and hold. But um, the VAS has actually outperformed because the dividends have been really well, have been quite good. So I think you, 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 you've got a point just because something's more volatile doesn't necessarily mean it's going to get higher returns. It's just going to mean it's more volatile. 
and there's a there's another point there that the finance industry has conflated the term volatility with the term risk and and they're actually two different things Vol- volatility is just uncertainty it's just amount of variability of price risk to me is is the risk of loss the, the risk of a permanent loss of your capital and and that's something that we want to avoid you mentioned the industry and of course you spent some time working on wall street and you share in your book some of your experiences about working on Wall Street. So what is it like working on Wall Street? Do Wall Street brokers and traders have their customer interests totally at heart? So you've got, you've got a dichotomy here. What, what tends to happen is you've, there are, I would say 99% of the people I've worked with are good, upstanding, honest people that honestly want the best thing for their customers. But the fact is they're, they're fighting an industry structure that doesn't necessarily care about that. OK, what, what the industry structure wants is more fees, more assets under management, because ultimately, if, if, you, if you're an investment bank, if, you, if you're on the board of an investment bank, your fiduciary duty is to your shareholders. It's not to your customers. So maximizing shareholder value is, is what they're all about. All right. And shareholders interests and customers or clients interests uh, are not always aligned. And so Charlie Munger, you know, Warren Buffett's business partner, has got a, a very famous quote. He says, uh, show me the incentive and I'll show you the outcome. All right. And if the incentive is to maximize fees and, and maximize assets under management, it may not always result in an outcome that is optimal for the clients, the, the investors. Funny about that. Yeah. Bit of a conflict of interest. Right. And you referenced Charlie Munger. So, of course, I have to ask because he's very famous for being business partner with Warren Buffett. And both of them, but particularly Warren, are well known for their investment advice. And there are many people who follow Warren Buffett's value investing method. What's your views on this? Well, firstly, Warren Buffett, he hasn't really been a value investor since the, since the early 90s. All right? It's certainly how he, he started off. And, and that's how he kind of became famous. And, and a lot of the, the books on how to invest like Warren Buffett are using the, the way he started. But the fact is, you and I, we, we can't invest like Warren Buffett. You know, we, we can't ring up Goldman Sachs and say, look, I, I want to invest in a convertible in your stock that's going to pay me 10% per annum because you're in financial trouble and I've, I've got the, the money and I can bail you out. You know, we, we, we just we can't do those sorts of deals. But getting back to my original point, if, if you're looking to make high single digit, low double digit returns per annum, following a value, a passive value investing style can work really, really well. And, and Warren Buffett's style is, is probably one of the more successful ones out there to follow. But if you're looking to accelerate your wealth creation potential or, or derive a, a meaningful income stream from your, your risk capital, if you like, uh, it, it's probably not going to generate the sorts of returns that, are, like I said earlier, really move the needle for you. And in your book, you talk a bit about technical analysis. And I always thought technical al- analysis was, as the name might suggest, technical and hard <laughs> and scary. Yeah. But you make it sound right. quite easy and approachable, sort of. Well, the way I teach it, it's it's very visual. And it's, it's quite intuitive. You know, one of my one of my trademark techniques is I teach people to look for rainbow logic and it's it's so named because uh, when you see it you, you see these beautiful colored rainbows on your charts which are visually appealing and and you can instinctively within a moment when when, when you see a rainbow right uh, my my second oldest daughter used to be obsessed with rainbows when she was a little girl and that was that was where I got the inspiration from for this, uh, <laughs> this, this type of indicator but it, it makes trend identification very simple, very fast, and very intuitive. So what are the different colours? Red and orange and pink. <laughs> you know, <laughs> seriously, it's, it's red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. Uh, we skip over indigo. <laughs> and so they have specific meanings when looking at the chart, obviously. So that's how you get Yeah, the when, when they're aligned in, in that particular colour formation, that means you've got a strong trend. <laughs> Thank you. And also in your book, you've spoken a little bit about risk tolerance like the conventional advice if you see a financial planner is they'll ask you what your risk tolerance is are you a conservative investor are you a high risk investor you know how do you feel about risk in these contexts 
And I guess that's something that I always thought was the right way to go about it. And certainly there were times in my life, such as when I was suddenly single, where I became very conservative in terms of my investing, Mm -hmm. really much more focused about paying off the mortgage and making sure there was emergency funds. If something happened, I could still provide for my kids. What are your views on this risk appetite and how financial planners approach this? I think that there are a couple of major problems with the way it's approached traditionally. Firstly, unless you are a seasoned investor and you've been through some bear markets and some market cycles, you've got no idea what sort of investor you are. They will ask you questions like, how would you feel if the value of your portfolio dropped by 40%? Let me tell you, you're going to feel like crap, all right? It's going to be (laughs) a a gut-wrenching. No, it's going to be an awful feeling. It's, and and but unless you've been through that, you you don't know, and you, it's very easy to hypothesise about it. And say, oh, I I just buy more, I buy the dip. But when you're when you're in the fog of war, it's it's a very different experience. The more important point, though, is I would say, don't ever let yourself get into a situation where your portfolio is down forty percent in value. Don't ever let that happen. Manage your risk proactively. You know, I, one of my rules is if, if my portfolio ever drops by 15% from a, from a high watermark, I go to cash. I just I sell everything and I, I just uh, I calm down. I spend the next 24 to 48 hours calming down and uh, I'll reapproach the market with a, a much cooler head. Because trying to trade out of a, a big drawdown like that, it, it's very, very stressful. And, and the thing about stress is stress literally makes us stupid. All right. When you're stressed out, your ability to make high, high quality conditions is greatly compromised. So one of the things I really hammer home in my book is the importance of emotional control. And the easiest way to control your emotions is to not get into trouble in the first place. And you mm-hmm. do that by proactively managing your risk. It's so true. People who are going through major financial duress, especially those who are on very low incomes or in debt, they often do make crazy decisions and a lot of it is because they just are struggling to make decisions struggling to make good quality yeah. decisions no it's it's how our brains are wired when the prefrontal cortex cedes control to the amygdala you know your <laughs> your ability to make high quality condition decisions is severely compromised yeah exactly and you're right like in terms of a lot of people if, especially if they haven't invested before or they've never invested during a downtown, don't know how to approach that. And I think we saw that in 2020 when we saw the big Mm. drop at the beginning of COVID. There were a lot of people, a whole generation really of people, who'd never experienced the the global financial crisis, who hadn't seen this before. And it was all new, dealing with with that kind of falling market. Yeah, it was new, it was scary. And and what happens time and time and time again is Retail investors sell at the worst possible point. Mm. You know, they sell when, when the pain just becomes unbearable and, and usually that marks the lower the market, you know. And we know that because we, we can watch what happens with, uh, with volume. You see a capitulation at the bottom, a flurry of selling, very high volume, and then two or three weeks later, oh, look, the market's trending up again. So what's the solution then? Like if so many financial planners do hand out these kind of surveys or spreadsheets that, you know, assess people's risk tolerance, are these kind of obsolete or is, is there a, a different way to approach it? There's, there's a different way to approach it. Uh, it. It really comes down to what sort of a person you are and, and what your investment objectives are. If, if you're happy handing over your money to somebody else and just letting them look after it, wh- whatever happens, then kind of that's your only choice. But if you're the sort of person that's prepared to put a little bit of time and effort and sweat into learning how to trade your own account, manage risk yourself, and not be reliant on somebody else, that there are far better ways of managing it. And, and bear in mind, nobody cares about your money as much as you do. Nobody. All right. It doesn't matter how credentialed they are, how well paid they are. They do not care about your money as much as you do. No one is going to do a better job of managing the risk on it than you, provided you've got the skill set and, and the, the knowledge. You're right. It's something that's very difficult to entirely delegate out. It's something you continually have to watch. So, what I say to people is, you, if, if you've got a financial planner or somebody that you trust, the last thing you want to do is, is just wake up tomorrow and get rid of them. But what you can do is start learning in tandem and just take a small amount of your money and start practicing with it, start learning how to trade. And, and what I find with, with my members is they'll, they'll generally start small. And then after two, three, four years, the, the amount of money that they've started with, I mean, A, it's 
they've been successful, so they've proven that it works, and B, they start allocating more and more of their conventional money to, to what they've learned how to do with me because they don't really see the point in doing the other things so much anymore. Mm. And then uh, you end up like me. I, I no longer have a long-term portfolio. All of my risk capital is what I would call trading capital. And so my my default position is cash. And, and what I do and what I teach people to do is instead of being exposed to risk all of the time through the market's ups and the downs, sitting there crossing your fingers and hoping for the best, my default position is cash. And, and what I'm looking for is high probability moments in time to expose myself to risk rather than being exposed to risk all of the time. So you dip in and out as you see opportunities, is that kind of Yes, it? exactly. And in your book, you also talk about your approach or explaining what it means to short the market and a lot of listeners might not understand what that means about how you can actually make money if the market's going down like we usually instinctively Mm -hmm. think that you only make money if the, the market's going up but that's not necessarily the case is that right correct so the the key to successful trading or investing as i said at the beginning is is buy low sell high but it doesn't matter what order you do that in all right, you can sell high and then buy low, and that's what shorting a stock is. Now, I, I don't short stock. I, I trade options. I, I trade put options. And there, there, are, there are only two kinds of options. There's call options and put options. And we buy call options when we think the underlying stock is going to go up. You just think call up, as in call up a friend. Uh, we buy put options when we believe the underlying stock is going to fall or go down. And you can remember that is put down. It's like put down your put down your suitcase. (laughs) And so what happens is when a stock price falls, you buy a put option on it, the put option will increase in value. I'd liken a call option to, it's like renting a stock. You know, you you probably couldn't afford to buy a a beach house in Malibu or a French chateau, but you might be able to afford to rent it for a week or two. And, And buying a call option on a stock, it's a bit like renting a stock for a couple of weeks or a month or, you know, a month or two. So you get, you get to enjoy the benefits of having that stock if, if it goes up in value, but you only pay a fraction of the amount up front. It's, it's like the, the rental fee, if you like. It's called option premium. Put option, which we buy when we think a stock is going to fall in price, it's like buying an insurance policy. You know, you buy home insurance that pays you out if, if something bad happens. And in that case, that something bad might be, you know, your house catching fire. Well, we can do a similar thing with stocks. We buy a put option, which works like an insurance policy on that stock. And in this case, there's something bad happening is the stock price falling. So the put option will pay you out if if the stock price falls, if if there's something bad happens. Thank you for that. And I like the fact you've made it simple with the suitcase references and everything else with the put down. (laughs) Because it can sort of seem counterintuitive, like even just talking about bears and bulls, like you don't, it's not often the direction that you think they are based on the description if you're not not in the industry. Yeah, and the industry, it's full of jargon. And I mean, that's something that Wall Street has done quite deliberately as well, just to make, uh, you know, the general public feel like outsiders. It makes uh, the people, makes the insiders sound more knowledgeable and sound like they really know what's going on. But it's, it's really not that hard to pick it up. And there's been a bit of literature too around how that particularly discourages women from investing because of the jargon, because of the fast nature mm. of it, because of the way it's often portrayed as being very competitive um, and um, fairly male and blokey, that women sort of think that they're dumb or stupid and they can't understand this. Finance and, and trading in particular, it, it does tend to have a very uh, a testosterone sort of a <laughs> culture or, or environment. I'm not a you know, I'm not a finance bro. I, I, I take it, like I said, a very holistic approach to it. I, I love teaching. You know, I've, I've loved teaching martial arts. I, I love teaching trading. And, uh, you know, over 40% of our members are, are female. Well, that's actually probably higher than the average, I'm guessing, when you look at the amount Much of women higher, who invest. Think, yeah. So you're obviously doing something right to make it yeah. approachable and to teach it well. So I have to ask, you have a whole chapter around sex. Now, when I say that, (laughs) as you know, it's in relation to trading and the analogy. So let's go there. How is trading like sex? Well, I mean, it's trading is like sex in that if you if you go into it with a 
specific objective in mind, it's probably unlikely to be that enjoyable for you. And, and <laughs> that objective that you've got may or may not be realized. Whereas if you go into it and you just enjoy it, enjoy the process, just just give yourself to it. And you probably find that it's, it's far more enjoyable and, and you end up getting what you want. <laughs> I see. So we're in for the journey. <laughs> Yeah, it's, 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 I mean, it's a kind of a, it's a risque way of saying uh, focus on the process, not the outcome. Mm, in the flow, <laughs> along with the Taoist yeah, philosophy. Exactly. Makes sense. <laughs> so I have one final question, and that is, do you have a frugalista tip to share? Is there something you do to save money? Yeah. Never go shopping without a shopping list. And this, I was reminded of this the other day. I, I did, did something that I, I really loathe doing. I, I accompanied my wife to Ikea. Oh, <laughs> um, and, and one, one of the reasons I, I don't like Ikea is just because there are so many distractions and, you know, my wife, oh, look at this or oh, look at, but you know what? The shopping list saved, saved us because if it wasn't on the list, we didn't look at it. So whether it's Ikea shopping, grocery shopping, or I think always have a list and that way you don't end up buying nonsense that you, you don't need and don't really want. And, and my other tip is never go grocery shopping on an empty stomach. Yeah, that's a big one. That's a big one because even though it's not necessarily shopping for food, it's just all your body is saying, give me stuff. And it's just so much more goes into the shopping trolley than you might have planned. Absolutely, yeah. So that's two things that I find really useful. The IKEA one's huge. I remember being pregnant with my second child and needing to find the toilet. Trying to find a toilet in the middle of IKEA is a nightmare. That's just even with a shortcut. They gave me some shortcuts. (laughs) But you literally have to walk through the whole process. You can't just say, I've finished looking at Ikea now, I want to get out. You've got to keep going. It's very hard. It's very hard. I mean, if, if you're looking for me in an Ikea store, normally I'll be in the corner somewhere rocking backwards and forwards while I suck my thumb. <laughs> you know. I'm, I'm, I'm joking. But yeah. Well, thank you so yeah. much for being my guest today. Now, how can people find you and find out about your trading program? Head on to my, my website, which is www tau of trading t a o o f t r a d i n g dot com tau of trading dot com uh, you can follow me on linkedin at simon re uh, follow me on twitter at simon underscore re that's r e e and uh, yeah i'd love love to connect with you thank you so much and if you've enjoyed this podcast as much as i have in chatting with simon today please make sure to like and share it and of course join the facebook group thank you so much my pleasure. What if we got You've been listening to the joyful Frugalista with Serena Bird. And of course, sound has been by Neil Hadley. You could talk, and I would listen, I would understand your mind. Oh, I love
to you.